Kind of reminds me of the time when a fellow was holding a tent meeting. You all remember tent meetings? <clears throat> used to have tent meetings, and, and uh, of course, you'd make provision, and oftentimes there'd be a, a microphone that had a big, long cord. And I heard about a story. A fellow was holding a tent meeting, and he was preaching, and he had a microphone, and he would take that cord, and he would pace on the stage that they'd built, and he'd go just as far as the cord would reach, and it would get tight. And when he got to that end, he'd swing back to the other side, and he'd go just as far as the cord would reach, and there was a little girl, he kept doing that during the whole service, and there was a little girl sitting in about the third row, and she tugged on her mama's coat, and she said, Mama, if he gets loose, will he hurt us? <laughs> and uh, that's not my goal today, I can assure you. Uh, how many of you remember a time when gospel meetings were an event? You remember what I'm talking about? Where people would come from all over the community for the opportunity to hear the gospel preached and for the opportunity to, in sincere search, to have their questions answered. Let me suggest to you that that can still be true today. It's not always. It's a pleasure to meet Elliot. He and I were talking a moment ago. I hold several meetings a year. Some of the congregations that I go hold meetings at would be better off not to have a gospel meeting. And I don't say that with happiness in my heart. They're having a gospel meeting just because they've always had a gospel meeting. They're not doing anything to invite their neighbors and their friends. They're not doing anything to promote the effort that they're having. They're simply doing that so that they can say, this is what we've done. Let's not do that this week. What we want to do this week is to be able to share the gospel in a way that will reach our friends and neighbors. Now, with that being said, let me make you a promise as we get started. I know as well as you know that if a person says even the right thing in the wrong way, that it can undo as much good as you've been trying to do with your friend for the last 10 years. In one moment, the wrong word can cause somebody to completely turn their back on all of the effort that you have made in trying to get them to hear the truth. I'll make you a promise. I'll do my very best not to do that. It should be our goal to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent. It should also be our goal to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven us. It should be our goal to say just the right thing in just the right way to just the right person at just the right time. And that's what my hope is, so that we can use the gospel the way God intended for it to be used. My favorite proverb is Proverbs 15 and verse 2, which says, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. And what that means is that there's a right way to say something even if it is true. And oftentimes individuals have a tendency to look at truth like it's a hammer. And someone told me a long time ago, a fellow holding a hammer thinks everything's a nail. And that's exactly right. And so our goal is to be able to open up God's Word and to be able to share it in a way that will cause individuals to want to learn what the Word means, what it means in my life so that I can respond to God's plan and live differently. That's our hope. And I want you this week, if you will do me this favor, to think about one person you can invite. Not asking you to invite 10. If you want to go down your road and invite all your neighbors, that's fine. But I'm asking you to invite one person. It may be the person that lives next door to you. It may be a child that has moved away from home. It may be a friend that you've met at the coffee shop. Doesn't matter to me who it is. Maybe the person that you work next to, that you talk to on your break at work every day. But I want you to invite one person. And it may be that they tell you, no, we do this at Gloucester Street all of the time. And I had somebody come to me and, and tell me, I have done what you have said 17 times, and 16 times they told me no 
And this week they told me yes. You never know what encouragement you might be to someone in a specific moment in their life. And so let's do what we can to encourage our friends and neighbors to join us. Let me give you just a preview of what we're going to be doing in this gospel meeting, and we'll get into our Bible class lesson. We're going to talk this week about what I'm calling hallmarks of the church. Now that word hallmark is a word that used to be quite common, but it's a very special specific term now. I'm not talking about greeting cards. That's how we normally think of that word today. But I'm talking about what might be referred to as a mark of authenticity. Now, the term came to be used in England many, many years ago. And it was used by counting houses, which were precursors to what you would call a bank. And they would take in a type of precious metal, and they would try to investigate, is this genuine gold? Is this pure silver? And when they discovered that it was, they began to put a stamp on those bars that would prove to others that this was the real thing. And it became known as a hallmark. It is a mark of authenticity. A stamp that lets others know this is the genuine, real deal. Well, that idea caused me to think about the church. If you look at our world today, our world is very confused, isn't it, religiously speaking? There are people, though, who are interested, who are searching, who want to know, what is this Bible all about? Is there really a true church, or is there just one among many? And I believe that what we're going to find as we study is that there are certain hallmarks that help us to identify the church. So we're going to talk this morning about conduct. The church has a particular way that it is supposed to behave, certain things that it ought to be doing. We're going to talk in worship about our identity. If your friend asks you, well, what is the church? How do you respond? We're going to spend time tonight talking about the unity that ought to characterize the people of God. What it looks like to be gathered together in one body and why that matters. And then as the week progresses, we're going to talk about the significance of biblical faith, the importance of salvation, and then ultimately the need for steadfastness. Those are all hallmarks of who we are supposed to be as God's people. Now, to start, I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. There are a variety of strategies that individuals use when they study Scripture. Sometimes we will focus on a particular section or a specific verse. Let me suggest to you this morning that when you're studying a book of the Bible, you would do well to try to come up with a summary or a thesis for what this book is about. Now, sometimes that's easy and sometimes it's not. It's not difficult to read the book of Hebrews and determine exactly what the author of Hebrews is getting at. In fact, he tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1, this is the main point of the things that I am saying. We have such a high priest. Hebrews is all about the superiority of Jesus, written to a group of individuals that were in jeopardy of turning back from the faith. They needed to know why they didn't need to turn back. And so it's rather easy to read Hebrews and come up with that purpose statement and understand what the book as a whole is about. The same thing is true about, say, for example, the book of Romans. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he goes on throughout the, the remainder of the book to talk about what that is and why he's not ashamed. There are other books, though, that are a bit more difficult. 1 Corinthians, for example. When you read 1 Corinthians, you realize Paul is writing to address 
certain situations that have come to his attention from the church at Corinth. He's heard from those of Chloe's household. There's obviously also been a letter involved in all of this because he talks about the things to which you have written me. And so he's addressing those issues from unity to morality to worship to the use of spiritual gifts all in order throughout that book. It's not one thing, it's several things. It's not always easy. In 1 Timothy, it's pretty easy. The reason to identify 1 Timothy's purpose uh, that makes it easy is that Paul makes very clear what he has in mind. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and you pay particular attention to verses 14 and 15, he says these words, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed... I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now there's a lot about that verse that we're going to talk about later on today, but it should at least suffice for us to note that at the beginning of verse 15, Paul, though he wants to come and be with Timothy, isn't quite sure that he's going to get there. He has things that he would like to say to Timothy in person, but he's not quite sure he'll have the opportunity to do that. And so if he doesn't have the opportunity to get to Timothy, he's going to write him this letter. What's the letter about? I'm writing to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, if you read that statement, you have to come to the conclusion that Paul is talking about appropriate conduct in the church. And so if you and I are going to ask the question, how should the church conduct itself? Doesn't it make sense for us to go to 1 Timothy and see what Paul tells Timothy to do? If Paul is writing to Timothy about conduct in the church, and Timothy, this is how you ought. That word ought is important. It doesn't allow room for someone wavering. It is a necessity I'm writing to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the church, which is the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So what does Paul tell Timothy about proper conduct in the church? We'll go to the first chapter. What does proper conduct in the church require? Number one, proper conduct in the church requires doctrinal purity. After his typical greeting that begins the letter, Paul continues in verse 3 and he says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Paul had been with Timothy in Ephesus. That's recorded for us in Acts the 19th chapter. When the riot at Ephesus takes place, Paul is forced to leave. He goes on into Macedonia, but he tells Timothy, you stay here. Well, what was Timothy's responsibility? What was Timothy's task? He's very clear about this. When I left you and urged you to remain in Ephesus, it was to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Does it sound like God is concerned with what we teach? He is, isn't He? He wants us to recognize that there is one faith and that we have an obligation to teach the things that are with accord of sound doctrine. Verse 4, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. It's easy for individuals to get sidetracked. It's easy for individuals to become so concerned with their own pet idea that they think this is the most important thing and that if everyone doesn't agree with me on this issue, then certainly we can't have fellowship. But Paul wants Timothy to understand that there is a difference in teaching doctrine and getting caught up with these fables and these endless genealogies which cause division rather than godly edification. 
And what he's getting at there is simply a principle that you and I would do well to consider, and that is that not every issue that comes up is of the same magnitude. Not every discussion that we have is of the same weight. There are some things that we simply cannot disagree about, but there are some things that we can. All right? For example, we cannot disagree. If we, if we put up on the, on the board up here, number one, I would say we cannot disagree about whether God exists. Is that right? You and I would have to admit there is a God. Otherwise, we can't have fellowship. All right? I would add to that list, number two, we cannot disagree about whether Jesus is the Son of God, right? That has to be very high on our list. We cannot disagree about whether the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. We cannot disagree about whether the Bible is the inspired Word of God. We cannot disagree about whether Jesus died to establish the church or that the church belongs to Him. All of those things are things about which we cannot have disagreement. But now if you got way on over on the other side of the board and you're at number 100 or 102 or whatever that might be, what about this one? What role do angels play in the world today? Now there are reasonable people who disagree about that. There are some who would argue that angels have no bearing or opportunity in the world in which we find ourselves. There are others who argue just as vehemently that they do. Just to tip my hand a little bit, I would say to you that if it's the case that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age, if it is the case that we're wrestling against the bad guys, surely God has allowed the good guys to help us. But you may disagree with that, and guess what? You and I can still be in fellowship. That's what Paul's getting at. Timothy, you've got to know the difference between those things that matter the most that we can't ignore, that we can't deny, and those things on the other side that reasonable people can disagree about. But the point that he is stressing to the church is that conduct requires doctrinal purity. Jude was talking about that very thing when he wrote his letter. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, in other words, Jude had something very pleasant that he wanted to talk about. He said, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. There are some matters that are more pressing than others. Some things that can't be ignored, some things that can't be denied. The church must be doctrinally pure. But let me add to the list, not only must the church be doctrinally pure, the church must be motivated by love. Notice what he goes on to say, verses 5 through 7 of chapter 1. He says, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience and from sincere faith, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Paul is writing to Timothy and he tells him, Timothy, you've got to stay in Ephesus. You've got to charge some that they teach no other doctrine. They've got to stay with the truth that they have been taught. But Timothy, make sure that all of your action is motivated by love. Shouldn't that be true of what the church does today? When we help those who are in need, it should be because we are motivated by love. Because we know that individuals need the love of God and we want to share that with them. When we teach individuals the gospel, we should do that because we are motivated by love. When we encourage those who are discouraged, we do that because we are motivated by love. We're not trying to make a name for ourselves. We're not trying to win arguments. Let me suggest to you that's also a roadblock to reaching your friends. If the only thing you're interested in is winning the argument, you're very rarely going to win their soul. What we desperately need is for individuals to fall in love with Jesus. Because when an individual falls in love with Jesus, when that individual sees what Jesus says, and he said, if you love me, keep my commandments, that individual is going to do what Jesus said. Our hope and our task is linked to our Savior. That's what we're supposed to be, ambassadors for Christ. Christ. 
So the church is to be doctrinally pure in its conduct. The church is to be motivated by love. And as you continue to move on through 1 Timothy, you find out that the church is to be given to prayer. Pick up in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul writes and he says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. That first statement in verse 1, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and givings of thanks be made for all men. Sometimes we think that when there's a list like the one that Paul gives here in this passage, that he's just using different words for the sake of emphasis, that he's simply trying to make the point that don't forget to pray. And I would agree with the general concept that he is emphasizing the necessity of prayer, but these specific words have different connotations. There's just a little bit of a shade of difference between the term supplication. That's someone who is begging for God's help or the idea of prayer, and there are various passages that help us appreciate what prayer is supposed to do, or the idea of intercession when we're praying for others, or the idea of givings of thanks, thankfulness. But you notice in that verse that he doesn't just say, do that for the people that are kind to you, for the people that you get along with, for the people that you love and that love you. You do this for all men. He adds to that list, and this is particularly important in the political climate in which we find ourselves, for kings and all who are in authority. It does not mean pray for the political party that you like and only for the political party that you like. It means pray for those that are in positions of authority. Now when Paul wrote this, the Roman emperor who would put him to death eventually is the very one who was in a position of authority. Let me ask you, do you suppose Paul ever prayed for the emperor Nero? How could he not? If he's telling the church you pray for kings and all who are in authority, you can rest assured the apostle Paul prayed for kings and all who were in authority. The church is to be given to prayer. And so if we're going to conduct ourselves appropriately, Paul's letter to Timothy tells us that doctrinal purity is a must. That our motivation should be given by love. That we must be given to prayer. He told the Philippians elsewhere, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But if we're talking about conduct, we can also add to the list that proper conduct in the church, a hallmark of the church, is submission to the will of God. And the paragraph that follows is an important one for us even today. Begin reading verse 8 of chapter 2. He says, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. Now you read that paragraph and it's obviously
Paul is continuing to think about the point that he made regarding prayer earlier in the previous paragraph. Chapter 2 begins in verse 1 with him saying, I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and givings of thanks be made for all men. But remember, he is writing to Timothy about how to conduct himself in the church. Well, what does he have in mind? In part, Paul has in mind the corporate function of the body of Christ. That involves the church when it comes together to meet. We talk about the word church in usually a couple of ways. In a general sense, talking about the brotherhood at large, and then in the local sense, talking about the congregation. But you do realize Paul used that word church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 to talk about the assembly. He said, let your women keep silent in the churches. That is when the assembly comes together for worship. Paul has that same concept in mind in 1 Timothy. He's talking to Timothy about how the church is to conduct itself when it comes together for worship. And he says in verse 8, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. This is not the generic word for human. This is the specific word for male. He has male spiritual leadership in mind in this passage. And so there is a particular way that God wants to be worshipped, what He expects of us. And there's a particular way that God wants us to adorn ourselves and to behave. In verses 9 through 10, He talks about the apparel that one should wear. And it's always been interesting to me that when we talk about modesty... We have a tendency to talk about people not wearing enough. But when Scripture talks about modesty, it almost always talks about people who wear too much. The point that Paul is making in the passage is that we should not dress in a way that associates ourselves with the world. Whatever the world is wearing, we ought not be wearing that. If we're trying to look like the world, if we're trying to fit in with the world, we're not going to be the peculiar people that God wants us to be. And in this case, most likely, he has in mind some of those temple prostitutes in Ephesus that Timothy would have been familiar with. You remember that temple to the great goddess Diana that caused that uproar in Acts the 19th chapter. And they were dressing in a particular way and it evidently had become fashionable so that all of the people throughout Ephesus were following that pattern. And Paul's telling Timothy, you make sure that Christian women don't look like those women who are going to that temple for prostitution. You don't dress the way people of the world dress if you want to honor God. You don't look like the people of the world. Proper conduct requires submission to God's plan. Submission in worship, submission in our morality, and then ultimately submission in doctrine. He goes back to this idea of authority in the worship assembly when he says in verse 11, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. There are so many people in our world today who go to that passage and they say, Well, yes, in that first century cultural context that would apply, but our world's vastly different. Well, it is true to say that our world is vastly different from that first century cultural context. Make no mistake about it. And if that was all that Paul had said, there might be an argument to that point, but it's not. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 13. He says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now that word for is important because it provides for us an explanation for what he has just said. Why is it the case that men should be the leaders in the worship assembly when we come together? And then he adds, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. Think about that for just a moment. Whose decision was it to create Adam first? It was God's decision. Could he have done otherwise? Of course he could. But he didn't. God chose this particular route. He goes on and he adds something else. He says, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. You remember the Garden of Eden, don't you? Standing there right beside the very place that God told her not to stand. By the way, Adam was with her. That's a mirror on us in our society today. God has things that he wants us to avoid. And sometimes rather than staying as far away from those things as we can, we have a tendency to get just as close to that thing 
as is possible, hoping that it won't bother us. Be careful. Adam takes, or Eve takes the fruit and she eats it. And what scripture says about Adam is really even more difficult because it says Adam was not deceived. He chose Eve over God. She didn't know what she was doing. He knew what he was doing. But the point that Paul's making in using both the creation order and the order of eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that God's de declaration regarding leadership in worship is tied to his sovereignty, to creation. There will never be a culture in the world in which it is true to say that Eve was created before Adam. There will never be a culture in the world in which it is true to say that Adam was deceived and not Eve. It will always be true to say that Adam was made before Eve and that Eve was deceived and Adam was not. And if that is always the case, then God's declaration for leadership and worship always remains static. A hallmark of the church. If you want to find the church of the New Testament, you've got to find a church that is preaching the doctrine that's found in Scripture. You've got to find a church that is motivated by love in all of its action. You've got to find a church that is given to prayer, and you've got to find a church that is devoted to what God's will says, submission to the authority of God. Now, as you move on, you find in this letter that a biblical church is going to have godly qualified leaders. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, all the way down through verse 13, Paul is going to talk about the qualifications for the bishops, also in other passages known as elders or shepherds. And he's going to talk about the qualifications for deacons. And he specifies the certain things that ought to be true of those individuals' lives. When you go through the letter of 1 Timothy, you also find that the church is to have within its membership individuals who are informed, not individuals who are unaware. In verse 4, or rather in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy and having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And then he says in verse 6, and this is really what should tip us off to the importance of this, he tells Timothy, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Sometimes we hear teaching and we wonder, why is that even pertinent to us? Why does that matter? Why do I need to know about some somewhere who is departing from the faith? Why do I have to know about this new doctrine that, that some are forbidding marriage and telling people not to eat certain foods, what difference does that make to me? We have this idea that, that if it doesn't specifically address my needs of the moment, that it's unimportant, that it's unnecessary, that we ought to move on to the things that I need right now. And Paul tells Timothy just the opposite is true. I think the bigger picture is simply this. You need to know that God has a plan and you need to know that people don't always follow it. You need to know that just because there is the plan that God has does not mean that individuals will always be eager to learn that plan or to apply that plan to their own lives. That there will be individuals who will depart from the faith. And because of that, you and I must do what we can to be aware so the church must be informed. Peter told his audience in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
just as an aside about that, you know, sometimes when we think about the devil, we act as if he's hiding somewhere. Like he's behind the corner over here, and if I walk around that corner, he's going to jump out and get me. Have you ever heard a lion roar? Most people haven't. But, you know, we live about an hour or so from Memphis. And uh, when the kids were little, we'd go to the Memphis, had a membership to the Memphis Zoo. And most of the time, Memphis has got a couple of lines, and most of the time those old lines, bless their heart, they're just laying there because they've got, you know, school groups that are coming and banging on the glass and kids are yelling at them, and, and they're just laying in the sunshine and not worried about anything. But every now and then, one of them will get up and roar. And let me tell you something. It does not matter where you are within the confines of the zoo, when the lion roars, you hear it. When Scripture describes the devil like a roaring lion, it is not trying to tell you that the devil is hiding behind a tree stump and he's going to jump out and grab you. It's trying to tell you that the devil is aggressively seeking you and you need to get as far away from him as you possibly can. You need to know what he's trying to do because he's out in the open with it. He's telling you. And yet instead of avoiding it, we get as close to that tree as Eve did. And then we're surprised when we fall victim. Be careful. Church needs informed members. The church also needs individuals who are benevolent. If you go on down into chapter 5, you see in verse 3 of that text that we're told to honor widows who are really widows. We have an obligation to take care of those who are in need. Now, that does not negate the fact that we have a specific responsibility to our families. If you keep going on in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 16 says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. You have a responsibility for your family. We usually get that backwards. People in our society today, when they have a need, they first go to the government, and then they go to their, their, their family, or, or then they go to the church, and then they go to their family. That's just the opposite of what God tells us. God says your first line of defense is your family. Then it's the church, and lastly, it's the government. We've gotten everything backwards in our society, and we wonder, well, why are we in the shape that we're in? One other thought about this as our time runs out. What does the conduct in the church look like according to Scripture? It looks like individuals who are spiritually minded. Let me read this last passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from their faith and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness... Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You're not living for this world, friend. We're living for that which is to come. Our focus can't be on what we have in this moment. Our focus has to be on the place where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That's a characteristic of how the church conducts itself. These are hallmarks of who we're supposed to be. That's why 1 Timothy was written. Thank you.